Hello, my name is Simon Cleebury. I am the head of arms control and disarmament here at the Geneva Centre for Security Policy. Today, we're going to discuss biosecurity. The COVID-19 pandemic led to a big increase in interest in biosecurity. For the arms control and disarmament community, that led to a renewed interest and a renewed focus on the Biological Weapons Convention, the BWC. The convention prohibits the development, production, acquisition, transfer, stockpiling and use of biological weapons. However, it does not have a verification regime. In December last year, December 2022, states parties to the convention agreed to create a working group on strengthening the convention. One of the key issues that the group will consider is compliance and verification. This will be the first time in over 20 years that this issue has been discussed. Much has changed in those intervening years, so it will not simply be a case of picking up where the previous discussions ended. New ideas, taking on board the significant technological developments, will be needed. The GCSP stands ready to support these important discussions by convening diplomats, civil society and biosecurity experts to help generate recommendations for how a future verification mechanism might work. I'm delighted, therefore, to be joined today by three experts on biosecurity, Dr. Philippa Lensos, Henrietta Wilson and Dr. Gemma Bauscher, all three of you from King's College London. Philippa, let's uh, start with you. Um, the first question I'd like to ask is, what is the significance of these working group discussions? Um, and why do we need a compliance and verification regime for the BWC? Well, verification has always been the biggest challenge for the BWC. Some states say that even with very intrusive inspection regime, you would not have, you would never have um, full confidence of compliance. And at the same time, the costs would outweigh the benefits. And particularly when um, it could create this false sense of security. Other states say, well, that might be true, that you don't have full confidence of compliance, but it's still worthwhile trying to gain, gain some kind of confidence. And so um, they would argue a little bit is better than nothing. And this, these different perspectives have been present since the very beginning of the convention when the negotiations uh, were underway in the late 1960s. At that time, it was realized we cannot reconcile these different perspectives. Let's put the verification issue aside. And so that was put aside. In today's security environment, where we are seeing continual allegations of non-compliance, it is especially important to restart that dialogue on what verification is, what it means to be, to have confidence in compliance today, and to start developing a plan for how to get there. Thank you, Philippa. Um, I'd now like to ask Henrietta a question. Um, are there lessons that can be learned from past verification efforts um, in other contexts, in other, in other treaty bodies? Yes, the short answer is the state's parties have a whole load of lessons to draw from uh, in this process that they can take from the treaty itself uh, and from mechanisms outside of the treaty. So first of all, in the treaty, states parties have come together in various processes through which they've built their understanding of some of the questions that Philippa raised about what verification is in this context, what compliance monitoring means in this context. Um, and two ad hoc bodies were very important in this history. Uh, Verex uh, evaluated verification from a scientific and technical point of view, and then an ad hoc group uh, was appointed to negotiate a legally binding protocol. The protocol didn't happen, but the work that states parties did through those meetings really helped to explore some of the fundamental issues about verification in this treaty. Apart from the BWC context, uh, there have been a number of ways in which states parties can learn about verification <clears throat> here. Excuse me. Um, you mentioned other weapons treaties, and yes, 
different treaties have made different compromises in verification that have, can be very informative to the BWC states parties. On top of that, there have been several instances of non-compliance, of non-compliance that have been dealt with completely outside of the treaty. And the one that I'd like to flag up is UNSCOM, um, that was established by the UN Security Council at the end of the first Gulf War um, to oversee the elimination of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction um, programs. Um, and uh, UNSCOM was surprisingly successful uh, in doing this um, through building up overlapping data sources and comparing different bits of information, they were able to find a biological weapons comp- program that was very sizable and that hadn't been known about beforehand. So this shows the states parties that aspects of verification are technically possible, even in politically difficult circumstances. Thank you, Henrietta. Um, I'd now like to turn to, to Gemma. Uh, Gemma, help us understand what we mean when we talk about biosecurity by telling us a bit about the different types of bio incident that we should be aware of. So there are a number of different types of biological incident, and it's worth emphasising that the vast majority of them are natural disease outbreaks. But most relevant to this conversation, there's a subset of incidents that are particularly important when thinking about this issue of verification and compliance. So, for example, we know that states have maintained uh, deliberate um, biological weapons programs, and there's always a concern that states may deliver and use biological weapons um, in various scenarios. A second type of incident we are worried about is the use of biological weapons by non-state actors, so terrorist organisations or other kinds of groups. And we've seen cults uh, use salmonella as as an infectious agent to cause harm in the US previously. Um, And and so that's a concern that non-state actors would get hold of biological samples. We're also particularly concerned about ambiguous events. So that reflects the nature of biological incidents and their uncertainty. So of course there's natural disease outbreaks, but where we have a time period where we're not sure whether an an agent has been deliberately used or whether it's simply a seasonal outbreak at a different kind of scale, we have to think about that ambiguity. And and again, that's that's where this conversation about, about the Biological Weapons Convention is particularly relevant. We've also seen recently an explosion in the types, in incidents that we would describe as fictitious disease outbreaks. And that really reflects the the rise of disinformation and misinformation. So being able to produce other effects in populations that are similar to that of biological events, but fear uh, population behaviour change, but without the need to bother using biological samples themselves. And then finally, there's issues around lab leaks. We know there's an explosion also in the use of of high containment laboratories around the world. And with that, it's important that we think about the maintenance of safeguards uh, around those samples. Uh, And labs are still uh, around the world. They still do leak their samples either accidentally or sometimes we're concerned about insider threats. So individuals actively leaking samples. And that remains a concern. So there's a number of types of biological incidents uh, that that, uh, are relevant to this kind of conversation around, around verification and compliance. Thank you, Gemma. Um, I'd like to turn back to you, Philippa, to ask you what you think the key elements of the discussions coming up in in the working group are going to be. What are the most important things that that states will need to come to an agreement on if we are to see a new, or if we are to see a verification mechanism for the BWC? Well, the first thing that states need to do essentially is agree to keep talking. Um, so it may just be that, uh, you know, in an ideal world, the outcome would, would actually just be an agreement to keep talking. Perhaps it would be another ad hoc group, um, like Henrietta referenced, uh, or some other dedicated um, body, which would then go into detail about well, what exactly do we mean when we're talking about a verification regime and what can we set up. The key elements of that kind of verification regime would first and foremost be about information sharing. That might be in the form of declarations uh, explaining what you as a country has, uh, what you as a state um, have in terms of infrastructure, uh, BWC-related infrastructure. It could be um, 
detailing um, the number of facilities you've got, the number of projects, the number of people working in BWC related activities, um, funds going into that, those sorts of declarations. And then a second element would be much more about how do you check that information? Um, and there can be different ways of how you would want to check that information, different possibilities. Um, there would be different tools, uh, different mechanisms, different processes. One of the big questions will be around, should this be on-site? Should it be purely off-site? If it's on-site, how often? Uh, which uh, facilities do you select to visit, uh, etc.? Then you would have uh, another element which uh, relates to investigations. If there are any suggestions or indications of non-compliance, how would you go about investigating that? So that would be a whole separate element. And then finally, of course, uh, so this would be, these are some of the key elements in a verification regime, but then you would also have questions around institutional support and funding. So these would be very large questions as well. How big of an inspectorate would you want uh, or would you need and how are states going to, to fund that? So those are all very large questions uh, on the table. Um, but as I said, for this first round of the working group, the aim is really just to make sure we keep talking. Thank you, Philippa. Um, I'm going to turn back to you, Henrietta. Um, it's been quite a while since the BWC states parties have discussed the issue of verification. Uh, and a lot, I think one would say, has changed in, in those 20 years since those, since those discussions. Um, I'm thinking particularly about the huge advances in, in technology over the last 20 years. What, uh, what impact do you think that will have on the way that verification would be done now? Yes, 20 years is a long time and there have been a lot of changes to science and technology and to the sorts of people that have been involved in biological weapons convention talks uh, and processes. Um, and science and technology, people often flag up that they change the risk factors of bioweapons, but they clearly also make a difference to the capacity to monitor and verify different parts of the convention. Uh, there have been massive difference in all sorts of ways uh, to the sorts of tasks that Gemma and Philippa identified, understanding diseases, uh, understanding declarations, understanding the capacity of states, parties. One uh, area that I'd like to flag up that's a, a, attracting quite a lot of attention at the moment is um, the fact that digital technologies have really transformed open source research. Um, so what I'm talking about is uh, the internet, uh, making available, publicly available information much more easily. Traditional media sources, traditional sources of information from trade data uh, or company reports alongside entirely new data sources uh, like social media or commercial satellite imagery. Um, and together, what these development means are that more people can do more monitoring tasks than used to be the case. It used to be just a few well-resourced governments could really track uh, things in, in great detail. But these developments mean that non-governmental groups can be engaged in things like understanding capacity relevant to the Biological Weapons Convention. And, uh, and groups can be involved in understanding baseline knowledge about naturally occurring disease, which will facilitate the task of distinguishing natural from uh, accidental or deliberate outbreaks. Um, so that's really quite an exciting set of developments. And it's accompanied by uh, a, a very big growth in stakeholders that are interested uh, in the Biological Weapons Convention. People from all sorts of international organisations, university groups, non-governmental organisations attend BWC meetings as observers and represent a huge body of expertise derived from open sources that can inform verification decisions and possibly processes. Whether or not these things are used or how they could be harnessed is really a question for the state's parties uh, in the talks they're about to have. 
Thank you very much, Henrietta. And I'd like to turn back to you, Gemma, for our final question. Um, it's not so much about the convention this time, um, but it's about the work that you've been doing um, with, with countries to help with their uh, preparedness for, uh, um, for, for biosecurity. Um, what are your main takeaways from, from the exercises that you've been uh, doing with, with those countries? So the first big takeaway is that there's a great deal of work to do to better align the field of biology with wider security imperatives. And in my work, I take the field of biology as, as a quite a broad a heterogeneous group. So I work across the health sector, biological laboratories, uh, I work with public health practitioners, um, and I've worked on this the biological weapons convention issues as well. So I think there's a a natural thought that because we work in the biosecurity field that these these issues are tangible and and uh, readily accessible but on the front lines of disease outbreaks where health public health groups and health practitioners are working in very constrained conditions the wider issues around security are not necessarily at the forefront of their thinking so that's the first important thing is that there's a there's an awareness raising piece to do there and following on from this issue around professionals, a great deal of work needs to be done to better invest in professional groups across the board, because that cooperation between security and biology doesn't happen by accident. And so investing in those health professionals, whether it's to be better equipped with detection technologies, to have more capabilities in that space, and to better understand the networks of communication and coordination that they can draw upon in ambiguous incidents, for example, or deliberate events, for example, is really important and absent in many places that I've worked in around the world, be it with Ukrainian professionals or with Syrian health responders, for example. Finally, wider investment in the international dialogue is essential. And that provides the, what I think we could call top level cover to all of these practitioners around the world who are doing the on the ground work that's essential uh, to maintain biological safety around the world. Uh, that brings us to the end of our Q&A. I'd like to thank all three of you um, for, for being with me today. I think it's fair to say that the issue of uh, verification mechanism or verif verification regime for the BWC is not going to happen overnight. Indeed, the working group discussions are mandated until 2026. The mandate of the working group only ask states to make recommendations. So we're not even, we are not even at a negotiation um, stage yet. So this issue is going to run for, for several years. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the, the GCSP, I'd like to say we um, would like to, to follow these discussions very closely, um, continue to convene uh, experts like yourselves um, to help feed into these discussions. And that's certainly uh, my cluster here at the GCSP, the Arms Control and Disarmament Cluster. We stand ready to uh, um, be a platform for discussion away from the conference rooms, um, perhaps in a little bit of a more informal setting, to brainstorm some ideas on what is, as we've been hearing from you, uh, a very tricky issue. So stay tuned. Um, let's do this again. I hope you'll come back, the three of you. Perhaps we can check in in, in a year's time or two years' time to see how the discussions are going. Um, so thanks very much to you three again, uh, and thanks very much for, for listening to this video.